content warnings for this episode may include anti-queer bigotry, gender dysphoria, racism, and ableism. Gender people would like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples in the unceded lands that the producers, hosts, and guests live and have dwelt upon. Today we honor the Ojibwe and Dakota lands. And our guest honors. Yeah, so I'm I'm coming from Treaty One territory, which is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and also the national homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. That's great. We honor the elders, the human, plant, and animal ancestors of these lands and celebrate the living descendants of these peoples. May all beings tend these lands for the goodness of the next seven generations and beyond. Miyati folks, welcome to Genderful, a talk show interviewing gender diverse folks about their special interests. The name of our show celebrates that gender expansiveness is wonderful. Hi, I'm Gender Master, and my pronouns are they, them. Hi, I'm Atlas of Phoenix, and my pronouns are also they, them. The focus of our show is to interview trans, non-binary, agender, and gender diverse people regarding their special interests, passion projects, and resources for the gender diverse community. We want our audience to know that this show is hosted by two folks who also identify as non-binary, transmasculine, neurodivergent, and disabled with the passion for telling trans stories. We invite you to remember that we are whole people with robust lives, friendships, challenges, and successes. We love and are loved, and we are delighted to share these stories with you. As always, we kindly remind our listeners that no person is a monolith of their identities, your identities can change over time and are valid every step of the way. And if you think you're gender diverse, you are gender diverse. There are no social or medical prerequisites to be included in the community. Welcome to Genderful, episode 83. This week, our guest, Ryle McGregor, they, them, is chatting with us about art, autism, and gender. Welcome, Ryle. Thanks for being here. Ryle is a two-spirit artist working in comics and animation. Meowster found them through their work in a comic anthology titled The Woman in the Woods and Other North American Stories. Welcome to Jennifer Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Good. Just some questions that we're going to start off with today. What might be things that you can trace back to your youth that indicated that you might be gender diverse someday? I think it's like kind of complicated because I never really thought a lot about gender growing up. I always just oh, was myself. It, I like, and I guess unconsciously when like, like around puberty, when everyone starts to kind of be set apart, I started like I felt like I was playing a role, but for the majority of my life, I've always just been, and my own understanding of myself didn't come from like a place of like, oh, I am a woman, I am a man. It was just that I am me. So I guess like I have like a, a lack of in some ways, but also I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I relate to that. I'm just me. So yeah, I think I've always been kind of like that ever since I was little. So this is a great question. Next was how has your relationship to gender evolved over time? Yeah, I think for me, everything kind of like started coming up around when I was in university. I was working at a historic site as a costumed interpreter. And at the time I was playing, so on some days I was playing a... Mm, a female character and some days I was playing a, a male character and I I started to realize that when I was playing the male character even though I was like putting on performance of, of being a man and I had like I used like a stipple sponge to have like a beard and like I wore my binder I did like all these things people still saw me as a woman even though in, in, in my head I was like well I'm performing a man, like I'm performing a woman in my everyday life. So why don't you see me this way? And it sort of like hit me that like, oh, <laughs> like this is kind of how gender kind of works in society and how like 
even with sometimes performance, people see you a specific way. And that's when I started identifying more with like being non-binary, like, uh, and, and two spirits specifically from my like gender identity. And it, it really helped a lot in like, I guess, explaining to other people kind of how I always felt inside. So yeah, I think like the evolution, I guess, that wasn't necessarily a change within myself. It was more of like, oh, I understand how people perceive me now. Now I have ways to explain myself to other people and, you know, like explain my experience. Oh, okay. All right. That's, that's awesome. Let me switch topics. How did you get started as an artist? I've, I've kind of been drawing all of my life. It's something that I, has always kind of been there for me. That and storytelling has always been like really integral as a part of my life. Whether I was like writing and drawing like comics when I was little, then like during some really hard times in my life, comics were kind of like my lifeline to kind of like some positivity. And yeah, wait, sorry, I'm just gonna look at the question again. So <laughs> I'm getting lost. That's okay. Uh, it was what, what, oh, what, mm -hmm. how did you get your stories and artists? Yeah. Yeah. And for the majority of my high school time, I wasn't allowed by my parents to take any arts. So I did science and AP for like a really long time. And then I went to university for like psychology and gender studies. And like, eventually everything just kind of came to a head where like, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't keep doing things for other people. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't, like I needed to do something that like I was interested in because it was like really, really hard to like go to class and do all these things. And all I was doing was staying in and drawing every day. And I had been drawing online in communities for a long time. Back in the day with like the Homestuck fandom. And I was a part of the Voltron fandom, unfortunately. You know, fandoms really helped me back in the day. It was really nice having that community. And then I eventually realized that I could kind of follow my passions for, for comics by going through animation. Because I would be learning the same skill set that I would need for comics. But I, if comics didn't work out, I'd have a backup and I could find jobs in animation. Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's actually lots of work in animation. It's kind of slowing down a little bit, but especially during the pandemic, it was a huge like animation boom. So I ended up going to school for animation at Seneca College in Toronto. I had the time of my life there. I also developed some very unhealthy work habits, but that's the animation career for you. And yeah graduated and now I'm working freelance in comics and animation and I'm really enjoying it. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. That's great. What art projects have you been working on lately? Sorry, I just needed some water. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. For the past little bit, I've been working on some graphic novel work that will be coming out with High Water Press. I can't really speak too much on them as they haven't really like discussed them yet, but I will have some graphic novels coming out. So that's pretty exciting. Those, yeah, thank you. Those ones aren't my, my stories, but I'll be illustrating them. And my, my goal for this year is I want to get together a comic pitch that I'll be writing and drawing myself. So that's, that's my goal. That's my plan. Oh, that's great. I guess it kind of falls down to like the next question, which is what projects do you have planned for the future? Do you want to talk about any of that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a, a couple of different things I, I really want to do and I'll get new ideas now and then. And I'm, I add it to kind of my list. I've got like a little notes on my phone of like different things that pop up and then I'll revisit them. Mm. I did a pitch in school for a story that I really wanted to write. Mm -hmm. And I've been, <laughs> I've been writing comics for a while, doing lots of short comics, but I've always wanted to do a longer form comic. And so I, I love witches. <laughs> so I'll say it's about witches. Okay. Um, and the central theme about it is basically around cultural genocide. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, so it's about like learning more about yourself and about like your culture and like 
all these sorts of things. And um, yeah, I can't really speak too much on it yet since it, I want to keep it a secret. Um, I mm-hmm. think I see that there is a question yeah, about there is a question. Mm-hmm. the difference between long form and short form comics. So short form comics are like like shorter comics. They usually don't go longer than like like 30 pages. It's usually like the short story form where there's there's not really too many complications to the conflict. The conflict gets resolved pretty and then long form you might have like you get, you have your central conflict but there's so much more that adds on to it. Like, oh, before they do this, they have to go do this and then oh, but now because they did this, they have to do this and that's more complicated and so it, it takes a bit of a longer time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's great. Thank you for, for answering that question. Another question I have for you is how does your queerness influence your art? I, I draw a lot of queer comics. Okay. It's, it's pretty much like all I draw. I, I, I love romance as a genre. And a lot of my, like, I think almost, yeah, probably all of them are, are like queer romances. I especially, I think... I think for me, something that I've always like strove for in my work is trying to make sure that like one is kind of like seen or feels seen in the work that I do. And, you know, I think, yeah, <laughs> I I think, you know, I want, for example, like non-binary people to feel like they're lovable, that they're like, like people can, you know, be attracted or like, you know, I think everyone like is lovable and beautiful and I want there to be more stories with diverse characters and just seeing like love in many different forms so yeah right that's beautiful that's awesome another question about identity is I want to pronounce this right but how does your metis identity influence your art did I pronounce that right close it's T. metis yeah Okay. So, how uh, does your Métis identity influence your art? Yeah, I'm wondering. Should I also explain Métis for yes, the audience? That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm Métis. I'm Red River Métis. So, Métis is a group of people. We're indigenous from Canada, although we live in many spaces. They're even in the U.S. as well. We we originated orig- like the the nation started from the relationships between fur trade men, usually French, English, Scottish, and First Nations women. Um, And then their children, Métis is derived from mixed in French. And Mm -hmm. so their children were kind of like alienated in a way because they didn't really fit in either space. And so those children ended up meeting up with other Métis children. And suddenly, like, (laughs) you have uh, Métis, marrying Métis, marrying Métis, marrying Métis, and years upon years, and you have like a unique culture, a unique language, like a unique like people that's formed from that connection. You know, we have our own like history with the government of Canada, like it, it's it's pretty huge, and uh, yeah, so that's the Métis <laughs> fast history lesson. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, so. For being Métis, I think it's affected my art and storytelling in specific ways. Sorry? What are some ways? Oh, for example, for my storytelling, I I think it affects a lot of the types of stories that I tell. So, for example, I mentioned with my pitch and in regards to, like, cultural genocide and uh, you know, even though, like... I might not in that pitch be directly talking about like, for example, like how does the Canadian government reconcile with like the, the, the cultural genocide of the Métis people, you know, like that might not be what I'm talking about specifically, but like those things like in a broader sense as well, I think are like, you know, other issues that impact my community as well. They're all things that are pretty important to me and in the stories that I tell. And I think as well, like I've had the like honor of like directing and leading a few different projects. And I think, you know, my identity also impacts the way in which I lead as an artist. I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, everyone's voice is heard, that everyone is on the same level. You know, even if I'm like leading a project, like my voice isn't more important than anyone else that is in my group. 
Mm -hmm. you know, making sure. Yeah. Cause everyone has a unique voice and experience that like, like, I don't know how someone else sees the world. They could see it in a completely different way and something that I'm not seeing. So like no one person is like <laughs> all seeing or understanding of everything. So I think it's really important for you know everyone's voices to be heard and all these different things i know canadians talk a lot about reconciliation it's a mixed bag for how for the how of it do you have any perspectives on that i imagine you Um, do but (laughs) well it's a very difficult conversation and for each nation you know affiliation is going to look so like i'm a part of the metis nation of like the red river but like the reconciliation that my nation is looking for might not be the exact same that an OG Cree nation might be looking for the same thing that a Dakota nation would be looking for, you know? And yeah, it's, it's really complicated. I like, like what aspects of like reconciliation? Yeah. It, this is, it's just kind of a general question. Do you want to just choose an aspect? I can, I can try. Yeah. I think, you know, there's a lot of like denial about a lot of things in regards to the past. I think there's a lot of when we look at like people's perspectives about Indigenous people, it's seen in a perspective of like, oh, those are people of the past. You know, they don't exist today. Or like, oh, you know, like residential school so long ago, you know, but like the last residential school closed in 1996. So that's really not that long ago. That's oh, when I was born. Right. <laughs> that's 26 years ago. Right. At least that's in Canada. I have no idea what that is for the States or for other parts in this world, you know? Mm-hmm. And like we talk about like the generations that it takes to heal from things like and like how like, you know, like for example, like, you know, I have friends that they themselves didn't go through residential school, but their parents did. And like even though they didn't like go themselves to residential school, there's still a lot of things that the effects of their parents going to residential residential school affects them. And it takes, Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, can you talk a little bit about what residential school is as comfortably as you feel? I just don't know what it is myself. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. So residential school was, it was run by the Catholic church as well as the, government of Canada kind of like hand in hand Um, and it was to to I I don't I don't like using the like slur so I'm not going to use it but like to kill the indigenous within a child and what they did was they stole children from their homes they took them away from their and they would take them into a school where often like they were like taken away from all their culture. They couldn't learn their language. They were beaten or hurt if they learned their language or were speaking or did any sort of thing related. You know, their hair was cut, like all these different things. There was a lot of like abuse that was happening. Like a lot of the children died and they're often the kids didn't get to see their parents again. Or if they returned back to their community at some point, they were so disconnected, you know, like when you take like a child away and they don't learn how to form connections and they're like constantly being like abused and they, they, they don't have their culture. They don't have that connection. Like, it's no wonder that like when they had their own children, like it's like so difficult for them to connect. And there's often kind of that cycle that happens as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really like, it was a really horrible part of Canadian history. And I, I think there was some in the U.S. as well, other parts of the world as well. So, you know, and it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> right, it wasn't. Not at all. Not at all. What, what are some things that you love about being Métis? And what are some of your favorite parts of your culture? Would you like to talk about? I think it's, it's kind of a difficult question because I've, I really struggled with identifying for many years like because I mean you see me I look very white so there's a lot of you know privilege that comes with that and I thought for a very long time that like you know like like that I guess like because of the privilege that came with that that like oh like all the like cultural genocide all those effects it's not that bad you know like and like it is like its own experience because like 
there's a huge privilege in in like how I am like there's like a lot of my friends a lot of their families like they're like racially profiled on a daily basis they're not safe like it's like horrible I mean especially you know in Winnipeg like the majority of the population here is indigenous and like I see how people are treated like especially because I'm white passing when I'm around other white people other like are like people will say things that because they think that they're with another white person but you know so it took me a long time to come around to be like okay you know I'm still indigenous you know and you know there's a lot of things I think like I'm it took me a long time to be proud and comfortable in who I am I think I dealt with a lot of like like abuse when I was younger and reconnecting to my culture has been like a huge help in a lot of that kind of the like for lack of better words like the spirituality that comes with that like you know feeling like the connection to the earth to the creator and like to my own communities you know beliefs was extremely healing and like grounding as I was going through that process being a part of something is amazing for a long time especially when I was in school I was so far away from being a part of my community you know, I was out in Ontario and if anybody knows the, the about Métis and the history of the Métis you know that not a lot of Métis go to Ontario and so it was very kind of isolating and people didn't really know much about the Métis and you know felt very alone so I think like community connection I love beating it's a very like grounding exercise for me especially when I'm feeling like super overwhelmed super overstimulated it's something that I can always come back to. yeah I think those are some some different things that are things that I really like about being me too okay that's great thanks for sharing the kind of segues into the next question where is when did you find out you were neurodivergent and how has that influenced your art I found out I was autistic last year almost exactly a year ago <laughs> and it was a big surprise for me especially because my mom like her job is to work with autistic students so I remember like it actually happened because of TikTok because I kept getting TikToks from the autistic side of TikTok and I was like no like I can't be autistic there's no way I I totally know you know like you know, I know how people are feeling, I think, you know, like all these different things. And I eventually ended up calling her up and I was like, is there, like, there's no way, right? And she's like, oh yeah, I thought since you were a kid that you were on the spectrum, but I just never told you. Like, cause I, I didn't think that you needed to know. Oh, that's um, you being told that. It's very mixed feelings because I feel like there was a huge part of my life where I, internalized a lot of these like feelings whenever I was extremely overstimulated or like burnt out and I like couldn't understand why I couldn't just do things like other people like why couldn't I just do things like why was I stuck like why is the sun so bright why does it make me want to cry <laughs> mm -hmm. like why is the music so loud but everyone thinks it's fine like among other things or like why do I keep missing these jokes it feels like people are kind of like saying things and I don't understand them and I hear people laughing and are they laughing at me or are they laughing you know mm -hmm. at something yeah, else right. but like I think it's difficult because like I feel like it was a good time in my life to find out I don't know how I would have felt like if I found out earlier in my life because I think like finding out also came with a lot of like grief mm -hmm. for like all that time of feeling like I guess like that kind of like internalized like self-hatred and all these different things mm -hmm. so it's 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 kind of like a complicated situation but it's had like a huge impact on the way that I I do my art <laughs> for example because mm -hmm. um, I used to like push myself and push myself and I would like push myself into positions that like I was like totally overstimulated, but I was like, well, you know, I, like, oh, this is good for my career. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I do this, like, especially I feel like a lot of like other autistic people like and, and myself, you know, like there's kind of like that drive to like 
make people want to like you because you're like you feel kind of like left out and so like you know like there's a lot of times I think where like when I got out of school I took jobs that I think I just really wanted my teacher to like feel proud of me for taking Mm -hmm. and to be kind of what they wanted me to be but I started to realize you know after my diagnosis that like I don't have to be that I can kind of make my own sort of like career doing the things that I love. And freelance has really been amazing for that because it allows me to create my own schedule, to plan everything out in specific ways, to take on the projects that I really enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think like, as I just like, I think, I think it also like affects the way that I story, I, I'm doing like my own storytelling too Mm -hmm. because I want to like do more stories in the future around like autistic characters and romance because I don't know I feel like in a lot of like the stories that are like told about autistic characters like not a lot of it is seen in like like those like people on the spectrum are like seen as like a romantic interest you know I don't know. I think I'm still kind of exploring that part of everything in regards to storytelling, but. Okay. What is, what was your inspiration for a Jackie date? Um, Tell us a little bit about what it is. Yeah. So Jackie date is a animated short in the third year of my Seneca animation degree there. I think in our year, there was four or five films It's group films. So like five to seven people got together in a group. We all pitched and then the like final films ended up kind of like whichever ones made it to the end by the most votes ended up getting made. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was super lucky and was super supported by my team. And I directed and wrote Dracudate, which is yeah a short film we made at Seneca College. It's a very cute short film about a vampire who is going on her, her very first date with a girl that she really likes. But she runs into a monster hunter. So she's trying to basically keep the date going because she really likes this girl, but she also has to escape the monster hunter. So, yeah. Nice, nice. What was the inspiration behind that? Yeah, I had been writing kind of a lot of like short, like like sapphic sort of things for a while. (laughs) And, you know, I guess like I wrote, if anyone was around on like Tumblr (laughs) in like, 2014 no not 2014 2017 2018 I wrote a comic called tinder and it's about a witch who every time she sees her crush her hair sets on fire you know I I, yeah you know I I kind of took the story structure from that short story I I wanted to make a like a queer short film for like our final films that would that had been my goal since first year so and I knew I wanted to do monsters because I love monsters I think also the queer audience usually loves monsters Mm -hmm. so I wanted there to be some sort of like twist and there's some other stuff but kind of like the inspiration of like the structure and stuff came from some of my earlier stories and then I applied it to that one and for where you can find Jackie Date, it's on YouTube. <laughs> so you can type in Jackie Date and it should probably be the first the first one there. I'm gonna check that out today. I wanna see that. Does your previous psychology education show up in your art sometimes? Don't know. Like when you make your characters? I I don't really often think about like it in that way. I think mm-hmm. At the same time as psychology, I was taking gender studies. And I think maybe like that part of my degree was perhaps more impactful in like my storytelling because it really like opened me up to, because like at that time in my life, I hadn't had a lot of experience in hearing a lot of other people's stories and experiences. And it was really kind of a turning point for me and like, like really like reaching out and trying to like understand and continue learning about everyone's different experiences, different stories, the importance of representation, all these different things. So I think, you know, that part of my degree (laughs) that I didn't finish, (laughs) you know, was, was important. 
All right. Well, thanks for that. Is there anything we missed about art, autism, and gender that you'd like to make sure you say before we move to the concluding questions? I don't quite think so. There's nothing that I can really think of. Okay. Let's try one more question here. What is your advice for aspiring comic artists and animators? Just go for it. Just make make what you want. Enjoy making it and post it (laughs) and go for it because i know that like a big thing that holds people back is you know the feeling of like what if no one likes it you know like oh like you know is this even good enough you know all these different things but you really never know like my comic tinder that went like viral on tumblr i had sold that at a convention like a few weeks before i posted it and it didn't sell very much People didn't really think much of it. I posted it online and it like blew up. And through like online sales, I was able to pay for half of a year of education at my school. So, you know, like, and at that time I kept thinking like, oh, the story isn't good enough. Like, what if no one likes it? It'll probably only get like five likes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, I had no idea that that would have happened, that that would have like touched people like Mm -hmm. in a way you know and there was a lot of people that got messages that were like oh like this was really important for me to see you know like like i yeah i don't know (laughs) i Mm -hmm. i think like you never know so go for it try it and continue making things continue going post it go for it (laughs) nice nice yes unfinished degrees rise up i'm with you a lot a couple last questions we talked about this when we were setting up so here's your favorite question can you share an experience of gender euphoria yeah we we talked a little about about, a little bit about this because i i can't really think of an exact moment well you you know yeah yeah in in the way of like every day you know like i i just i enjoy being myself in the present you know who i am and yeah (laughs) okay that's great all right what would you like to make sure folks know about your perspective on gender and non-binary trans issues that's another one of your favorite questions we talked about earlier (laughs) oh no i i totally thought of an answer to this too and then i forgot it i guess as kind of like as an add-on to what i was saying about just go for it I think especially for anyone who is like a person of color, who is like queer, part of the LGBTQ plus community, you know, neurodiverse, like, I think it's really important that we all get our stories out there, you know, the intersectionality of all of our different identities, you know, like, there's so many stories to be told. And like, I think like, something that I'm so excited about as being like a comic creator is like hearing all the new stories. So, you know, if you're a creator out there, you know, like let your voice be heard, let your story be heard. I think it's really important, you know, that everyone has a voice and a story. Yeah, that's (laughs) that's what I'll say. So thanks for coming on the show. I'm gonna just do some cross promo for you. Ryle McGregor is a queer Métis artist who works in comics and animation and their work centers around creating fantasy and sci-fi based romance stories that make people smile and the twitter handle for it's called raise drawing drawings at twitter.com and socials would be raise drawings insta twitter and tumblr here's this week's counter query that you can answer on our social media platforms How do your various identities influence your creative works? How do your various identities create your works? And so let's see, coming up soon next week, there will be no gender fall, but on April 3rd, we'll be interviewing Aaron Embry about gender, spirituality, and creativity. Community updates, Trans Day of Visibility is March 31st. Hope you'll have a great one. And that's really about it. Do you have anything else you want to add at all? No, I think I'm good. I I hear that chat is saying that the the comics look lovely and wholesome. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the chance to like speak. Yeah. Sure. It was lovely to have you. Thank you for taking the time to, to spend time with us today. We really appreciated it. Genderful would like to thank our guests for being on this podcast. 
If you'd like to catch us live, join us on Mondays at twitch.tv forward slash gendermaster. Show notes will appear in the edited version of the show on Fridays on both YouTube and podcasting platforms. If you have a question you would like the host to answer or are gender diverse and would like to request an interview, please send an email to genderfulpodcast at gmail.com or sign up via the website at genderfulpodcast.com. As a gender diverse community, The Clatter wants to assure our listeners that we are prepared to moderate our spaces. We will get positive and negative feedback on these shows and topics, and we have a moderation team on our channels, socials, and Discord server ready to deal with this. Please join our Discord server at discord.gg forward slash meowster to meet the community and get a regular digest of solidarity resources. You can also support us with subscriptions on Patreon, following and reviewing us on your favorite podcasting platform, or engaging with our posts and content on social media at genderfulpod and at gendermeowster. You can take a few moments to also rate the show. We will post any five-star reviews on our socials, so get creative. Mention a special interest of your own, a project you're working on, or even say hi to your comfort person in your review. What pawa? This show is made possible by volunteers, tips, and subscriptions. Shout out to the folks helping us coordinate guests, edit the podcast, moderate the live chat, and post on our socials. Artist credit for Jennifer. Genderful's theme song is called Hope by Free Range Megs, a.k.a. Soma. The Gender Meowster logo was designed by That's Barnaby and edited with consent by Trans Griffin. Genderful's pre-show is wrangled by Juice Tex. Genderful is edited and mixed by Trans Griffin and Alexis Fandom. Genderful's social media is managed by Queer to Help. Genderful is hosted by Atlas O. Phoenix and Gender Meowster. Genderful is the intellectual property of Gender Meowster. All rights reserved. Trans rights are human rights. That's right. <laughs>